the semester this week. Well, hi everyone, and welcome to our wrap up for our fall 2014 cohort. My name is Jennifer Madrill, and I'm in Chicago, Illinois tonight, joined with Kim Phillip and Sandy Royer, and a couple other students are straggling in tonight. Um, this is a recap of 2014, which is pretty much the first year of existence for Designers for Learning, and we have been blessed to work with a wonderful client, Grace Centers of Hope, um, with Kim Phillip and Courtney Phillips, and the volunteers um, that work with them, uh, Bonnie Shelnet and others. And so what I really wanted to do tonight was to give any student that was interested in um, coming and telling us what their experience was like for this cohort, tell us a little bit about what some of their design decisions were as they put their instructional modules together. And I also wanted to start out before um, I turn the floor over to the students that are here. Um, I just wanted to run through some of our um, numbers, kind of big picture, how the, the year panned out for us. So I start out every session and I end every session with a huge thank you. It really still boggles my mind that this somehow works, a 100% virtual e-service learning experience. I've never met Kim, which I think we have to <laughs> rectify at some point in 2015. Uh, and I haven't met um, any, any more than probably a handful of the students. So I really thank everyone for their pioneering spirits uh, to give this a chance. And, um, and hopefully we're giving Kim and Courtney and those uh, at, that are working at Grace Centers of Hope some instructional modules that are helpful to them and also giving students the opportunity to see what it looks like to put on a real design, uh, instructional designer's cap and, and give this a try. Um, so just kind of starting out um, all about us here, talking about Designers Learn for Learning. This really has been a, a huge transition for us from where we started in January. It was just basically me, myself, and I with an idea that I thought this might be something we could give a try. And um, the support that I have received has, has truly been overwhelming, and, and I, I mean that in the best positive way, um, culminating with us becoming a full-fledged not-for-profit um, in August of this year, we're waiting for our federal filing to get that official 501c3, um, but that's paperwork that's in the pipeline, and um, hopefully we'll know in the next couple months, um, or we'll get the final uh, approval for that so we can start getting that grant money rolling in. Um, but it really is um, very exciting for me to be able to now conclude the year with a, a true nonprofit corporation that exists in the eyes of at least the state of Illinois at this point. Um, and here's our board of directors. I wanted to um, give the opportunity to highlight uh, Jill Stefaniak was a co-facilitator on our current cohort. Jason Ingerman is going to be a facilitator in our spring, spring project. And then uh, Dr. Monica Tracy is the person who actually introduced us to Grace Centers of Hope through a contact of hers, Bonnie Shellnut. So this is kind of the core group behind the scenes uh, at, at Designers for Learning and represents our nonprofit board of directors. And I wanted to formally introduce them and thank them um, as part of our year-end wrap-up. So as I said, we really couldn't be here without the pioneering spirit of Grace Centers of Hope, our nonprofit client for two cohorts in 2014. Um, they are a, a 501c3 nonprofit, and um, I'll give Kim a, a, a chance um, to, in a moment, to give us a sense for what they're looking for in 2015. Um, but they came to us, uh, or we came to them, actually. I guess we kind of found each other through Bonnie and when we started speaking. Um, and we really quickly um, hit it off in terms of what uh, being able to align what their needs are from their education program and what our needs were in finding instructional opportunities to students um, for students to work on. And we couldn't be on our side of the fence anyway. We couldn't be more happy to have partnered with them as our first client and hopefully for a very long-term relationship working with them in the future. And so, as I mentioned, just to give a little sense of history for those who may be catching the recording and aren't familiar, um, uh, the need that uh, was presented to us by Grace Centers of Hope, they provide GED preparation for the folks that are their clients within uh, Grace Centers of Hope. And unfortunately for all of the, those that are preparing folks for the GED, the test changed fundamentally in 2014. And so um, the test materials that they had been using were a bit out of date and misaligned with the current version of the test. And so they were looking for some assistance in creating new resources. And so what that worked out really well for us because, as I said, we had students, instructional design students, that were in need of finding 
um, experiences to design instruction. And so it's that overlapping need that is what we've been working on for the past year. And so I'll go through the next few slides kind of quickly, but um, they, they, I, just, I, I also wanted to, <laughs> before I get too far in talking about service learning, a lot of times I'll be in a, a session, in a presentation at, acad at an academic conference, and someone in the back will raise their hand and say, I have no idea what you're talking about when you say service learning. And when I think of it, conceptualize it myself, and as most people do, they think of it as like a pie chart. And so if you think of the experience, a portion of it is academic coursework, a portion of it is work-based applied learning, but then what makes it the service piece of it is working with some community-based partner. Um, and that's the community service piece that layers in and, and why most people contrast service learning from some other types of applied learning or experiential learning opportunities. And what's unique about what we've been doing, it has been a 100% virtual service learning collaboration, meaning that we do not ever get together face-to-face. -to -face. We use technologies of using websites for asynchronous communication or using what we're using here tonight, Fuse Meeting, to have our synchronous sessions. And so it's posed some challenges, but also some, also some cool opportunities. I'll show in a moment a slide that shows how we've collaborated across many, many states in the United States that we would never be able to do if we were confined to just a face-to-face -face type, um, type of setup. So if you'd like to follow along, and again, I'm kind of <laughs> tailoring my messages to those that may be listening to this and are interested in working with us in the future. Um, if you pop over to studios.designersforlearning.org, you'll see where our cohort for the 2004 of fall semester has been living. It will give you links to the deliverables for the students as well as you can trace back through all of the discussion forums where the students were first introduced to Kim and Courtney and where Kim and Courtney provided feedback and responses and you can also see all of the exchanges we've had as far as updates to our pro uh, project and things like that and it'll give you a sense for how the actual experience works. So just by the numbers, let's just spend a little bit of time before I turn it over to Sandy and any other of the students that want to talk about their specific projects. But so far in 2014, um, what, what is most shocking to me is that we have selected from the pool of applicants who've provided applications to us to be volunteers for us. It is a selective process, so volunteers submit an application and they're reviewed and based on the amount of slots we have to fill the cohort, we select um, ba been primarily based on the experience level of the student. And so we have had students representing 22 different instructional design programs across the United States, which I think is pretty amazing because I don't know if I even knew there were 22 and I'm quickly finding out there are many, many more than that. But I thought that was pretty cool um, that we did have that reach already in the first year. And it's kind of hard probably to read on this tiny little slide, but here's some of the university affiliations, a lot of the big names that you've heard of before, uh, Brigham Young University, University of Minnesota, University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, Purdue, I'm kind of hitting some big 10 schools here, um, as well as Paige is there, Paige is at Moorhead, Moorhead State, she just joined us tonight, um, and my alma mater, University of, uh, or Indiana University at Bloomington, so, uh, as well as Old Dominion University, just to name some of the 22. And then in terms of the student participation, we've had 32 students that we've selected to be volunteers in 2014, and each of those students was sponsored by a faculty member within an instructional design program. So that, that then led us to build relationships with 27 different faculty sponsors, which again for me is pretty darn cool um, to be able to get out and, and, and meet and reach those, um, those faculty. And so what the students have been working on in the past year are 12 different design projects, and I'll share in a moment what the ones we worked on in the fall. And again, all of these projects were completely aligned with um, the need of Grace Centers of Hope and working with Kim and Courtney on what their specific needs are. So here's the slide I mentioned a moment ago that gives you a sense of what our participation is by state. I filled in with red those um, states in which we had students um, participating. It could be more than one school within one of the states. So Grace Centers of Hope is there in Pontiac, Michigan in blue. And so my goal is to continue to fill out the United States map with red. So we have participants from all the states all coming together and, um, and working with Grace. And as I mentioned at the outset, 
this is a virtual learning, e-learning opportunity, and there is certainly no way we could have representatives from, say, California or Florida or Texas uh, make the commitment of driving up and having face-to-face interaction. So this whole idea that this day and age we're able to have these virtual collaborations is, is pretty cool. And I think a graphic like this kind of puts it in perspective for me as kind of an old timer before there was, was such a thing as e-learning and online learning to think that we're able to do this to, in this day and age um, to be able to support the, um, the work that Kim and Courtney do sitting in Pontiac, Michigan, that we're able to help them in all the different places that we reside as part of the cohort. And then I mentioned to Kim a couple times before we started tonight, um, this is always kind of exciting tallying up the grand total. All of the students this semester were asked to keep a, a, a running estimate of how many hours that they um, volunteered on the project. And so um, of the 10 students that were um, part of the cohort that concluded and turned in their deliverables, they, um, they estimated that they volunteered 446 hours in total. So that's pretty close to the estimate. We ask each student to budget approximately 40 hours a semester. We were probably a little bit low and we'll bump that up for an estimate for students in the future. So the students are uh, roughly volunteering between 40 to 50 hours um, apiece during the 15-week project. And so now, now I'm going to stop talking here after the first 10 minutes and, and pass things over to the students who are here. And if you are interested in seeing the students work, probably the best way to do it is to hop over either to our website, which is, um, again, studios.designersforlearning.org, and then you'll see a couple different links on that site where you can click and find the students deliverables. They're actually PowerPoints. That's where we conclude our deliverable. And the best thing to do is to click on the link. It will take you to a Dropbox folder where you'll find all of the PowerPoint presentations. And it's probably best just to be able to click through it there. We may have a little bit of trouble tonight using the interface here, the, our synchronous interface to try to, um, to play them because some of them include audio, which is sometimes hard to uh, to run through on the synchronous system that we have here. So if you click on either studios.designersforlearning.org or this um, shortened URL that I have here on the screen, um, you'll be able to see the, the, uh, the work the students did. And um, let's see, I just wanted to just skip over here real quickly. These are the units the students worked on. Unfortunately, we had um, some unfortunate situations with the uh, um, students in Unit 1, and they weren't able to continue their work on the project. Um, life got in the way, and, and they weren't able to continue their participation. But we did have the other, um, other six units uh, that did participate. We had um, a, a mixture of science and writing and, um, and math. And then also we had one unit that did a revision to a project that was done in the spring semester that was a social studies um, uh, focus. And so those were the ones that the students concluded. And um, I think with that, I don't know who wants to hop in, uh, Paige or, um, or Sandy, do you want to take the, the floor a little bit and just walk through for us what the, um, first of all, probably what the experience was like for you and um, and maybe provide for Kim some idea of what your design strategies were as you as you work through your project. I'll just make sure everybody's unmuted and, and feel free to to start chatting away. You going? Are, are you going, Paige, or am I? Um, it doesn't matter. Whichever. Do you <laughs> want to set it up or anything? Oh. Uh, I'm I'm just I'm I went with this is informal so I didn't really plan um, anything uh, I that's perfect we didn't either that's perfect <laughs> yeah go ahead Sandy all right well um the experience was great I I really liked it when um honestly you know I the I loved the what grace um, is doing. I think that it's amazing. Um, and so that was half of it for me. And of course, the other half is as I'm getting ready to graduate, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, you look, start looking at jobs that are out there and everybody wants experience and um, you don't have any. Um, I mean, I have 25 years teaching experience, which I guess counts for something, um, uh, probably a lot of something, but um, also that work product. So that's how I got involved, um, kind of on an internet down the garden path sort of way is how I ended up here. Uh, but I was really excited to participate um, and put to use the skills that I've been learning in college and then, um, you know, 
try my hand at making this completely online um, unit. And then I was really excited when it was math because um, for 20 of my 25 years, I taught algebra. So um, that was a good fit for me. Um, so And so you um, um, worked on unit five. Got started. Do you want me to keep going on my mm -hmm. unit? or? Yeah. And so you worked on unit five, right? I did, yes. The oh. uh, combinations and permutations. And maybe, and, uh, Kim, I wonder if maybe you could help us um, remember why we picked this as a topic. Uh, and I know, as we said at the beginning, at the outset, clearly the GED test has changed. But um, did you want to give a, a, a couple sentence uh, description or take as much time as you want? Actually, I really don't care. <laughs> um, but did you want to kind of get, give us some insight on where you see the students stumbling over this as a particular topic as they're preparing for the GED? Yeah, you know, uh, combinations, permutations, uh, you know, it even like, I, I can't even figure it out half the time, um, you know, figuring out which is which and, and which you have to do. And um, it's interesting because it's in math and science. So they they use this and even sometimes uh, may, there might be like a tricky question in social studies where you actually have to think through something so it's it's a skill that they have to have in those two sections uh and everything that we had was either as a resource was either very elementary or just too short and we found that they just weren't getting it well enough so even with worksheets they still needed that learning module so that was the reason that we picked that one and um and kim it might be a good time also and, and sandy i'm kind of stepping on your time but just to maybe you can add your two cents as we talk about how our how the difficulty of us putting our units together trying to align with the ged standards and so when Kim and I first started speaking, it was before two, January of 2014, so there wasn't a lot out there at that point. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard to design instructions not knowing what you're designing toward. And as we, as we moved along, we found more resources from the GED in particular or the College and Career Readiness Standards. Um, but I think, and, and maybe this is a good time for Sandy or Paige or any of the other students to step in and say, give us some perspective on what it's like to design these units, keeping in mind what we're now finding out more and more about what the alignment needs to be with the GED standards. Well, I came at it um, looking, uh, I've been doing some curriculum work for my school district over the last few years as we've come into the um, Common Core State Standards uh, in the K-12 world. And so when I first um, saw the, the topic that I had, then that's where I went. I went out looking for those um, standards, and that's how I came across that one document that we ended up using. Um, and a well-written document, um, I mean, I read, of course, through the, the college and career readiness um, information, but it wasn't specific. Um, and whether we like it or not, we're preparing students for a test, so we need to teach what they need to know for the test. It is. So, it, 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 it is a rub that, it, you know, it took us a while to get over that. <laughs> you know, we, we, we rail against that so much in our careers, and it's like, well, you know what, Let's, it's real here. We're, <laughs> that's what our job is, to help people prepare for this test, so we better at least know what they'll be tested on. Exactly. So, um, and that's where we went. And then also um, some of the information that um, was provided, I, I think maybe it was through the first um, online meeting we had um, where they talked about, you know, how they wanted that focus to be, you know, practical for those students to be able to um, calculate with their calculators. Um, you know, it's a scientific calculator. It needed some instruction. Uh, so that they would be able to use it rather than spend a lot of time on lengthy formulas that um, they're not going to um, probably remember well enough to be able to use on the test because they have so many math concepts they have to cover. And um, so and with the use of the calculator, um, that was part of uh, what I put into the unit was that idea that um, we weren't going to spend a lot of time explaining why the formula works. We could do it, but um, it isn't what they really needed. And Kim, I think, and, and Sandy, you can also chime in here. I believe even during the course of your project, we found out there were changes or maybe our understanding changed as far as 
what the students are given in terms of calculators. Is that right? I think we were originally thinking it was an online only calculator. And then Kim, I don't know how that ultimately panned out, but they're able to bring calculators in. Is that correct? They are. Yeah. Um, originally it was this online only calculator and, um, our students, our first couple of students that went, that was when they came back, that was their biggest complaint. They said this online calculator took up, you know, half the page. Um, every time you clicked on something, it would, it would literally click so loud that the person testing next to you would look over and completely annoyed oh. with the fact that you were clicking, clicking, clicking. Uh, and it was so cumbersome and they had, to, they would have to, um, to, you know, minimize it and then write things down and then bring it back up again. So I think they heard that feedback loud and clear from the students and decided that they were going to let the students bring in calculators, which was great because they use those calculators in our classroom. So they're kind of just bringing their class, you know, they're bringing their calculator that they're using in the classroom right in there. And so I think that's that, been that, good. That's great. And I think, Sandy, that was something on the fly. You, your team had to kind of make adjustments, right, based on the original assumption and then and then changes um, as well. Right. A, a little bit. I mean, we, we were using the, the online calculator, um, but it is it, it is the same calculator that they use as far as the model. So the buttons are in the same place and they, yes. they act the same way. So th that part worked out great. Yeah, that's great. And Paige, did you want to kind of give us a sense? You were on um, Unit 3, right, uh, responding to the writing prompt. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, and if my partner would like to jump in at any given point. But, um, yeah, our unit looked at, you know, how to respond, how to, you know, tackle a writing prompt. And it really dealt with out, you know, how learning how to outline, learning how to get your ideas on paper and preparing to respond to the GED writing prompt. So, um, you know, we we had a I think it was a real learning experience for the two of us. Um, you know, we started out I come from a very um, kind of special ed focused paradigm. So I kind of had to work my way, use that, but yet work my way away from it to some degree. And then um, I'm trying to think what else as far as when we were preparing, what was interesting, it was such a cool learning experience because our design plan, we kind of went down a road and had to pull back and kind of change um, what we were doing. And we learned a lot from it, you know, being flexible in the moment. So it was really cool. Yeah. And that is something, and you know, we can have a, a conversation, um, Paige is now next semester going to be a co-facilitator, which will be cool because now she'll have the opportunity to take off the student designer hat and put on the, the facilitator hat. Um, and to, to, to kind of backfill what Paige was saying, we have a process in which students turn in a design plan based on feedback from the client um, as the facilitators as well as, well as peer review. Um, the students then prepare a prototype, and then that goes through a peer review, client review, facilitator review, and then they make revisions then to a final design uh, document, or I'm sorry, final deliverable, instructional module deliverable. And so it's a very iterative process, and we are in a confined 15-week uh, design space, and we're all virtual. So the timing um, gets to be an issue, and Paige and I have already had some discussion on that as well when we're laying out the schedule for the spring is you want to give people enough time to review things and offer feedback, but all these things need to fall in that 15 weeks. And so I think, Paige, you, you and your partner made um, some really good critique as far as how much time is needed between each of those review and revision cycles. And so, as you're saying, um, the feedback you got on your design plan required um, a fair amount of revision for the prototype. So any thoughts on that, Paige, now that you're thinking about being a facilitator, how we could make that a little less painful for the students and yet give them uh, ample feedback to make revisions? Well, I mean, it is in one way kind of painful, like you said, in the moment. But, you know, unlike our our assignments in our doctoral programs, you know, it's it's real. You know, when we're, you know, working on a project for a client, there's a good chance that we're going to turn in our design plan. And for whatever reason, um, you know, you have to go back and, you know, go back to square one or square two. So um, I think it was 
I'm glad it happened because I think it it um, caused us to really have to, you know, try to be better designers and be flexible. So in that sense, it's good. But then at the same time, like I said, you know, after we got our design plan feedback, you know, we felt like we needed a little bit more time. But otherwise, it, in hindsight, it was a really good thing because you know, because your assignments in school, it's just like you get your feedback and you're on to the next assignment for the semester. But this just, you know, kept going till we got the product we wanted. Right. Right. And Kim, maybe it's, um, would you mind offering us a little bit of feedback on what this review <coughs> feedback process is like from your end? Because it is quite a time consuming process for you and Courtney and Bonnie as well to offer feedback. And we very much appreciate it. Um, is there anything we could do to make that process a little easier for you as a reviewer? I think one of the things that was our big takeaway um, exactly to what Paige was just talking about is I think one of the things that Courtney and I learned was that we we feel like we need to do a better job on the front end, having conversations um, and being a little bit more specific about what we're looking for as far as, you know, from a client perspective. And I, I felt like uh, that was something that we learned, you know, from, from Paige's group as well. So um, I think then, you know, going through, it is a short timeline to go through and review them, but it was, it was, that was a good process for us. Again, to my point of, I don't feel like we did a great job just, you know, laying it out on the front end. And that was a big learning. It was a big aha for us at that moment when we said, you know, um, gosh, I don't think we did a great job explaining exactly what we're looking for. And then we gave them some more information. Um, yeah, Paige, you guys were able to come right back with exactly what we were looking for. So I was pretty impressed when I went through your final, um, you know, your final deliverable when I went through that. That was great. So I, I feel like you guys did hit the mark and that it, it is, it's time well spent. Yeah, it you know it, it's a <laughs> it's I always say it's a purposefully messy process, right? That you know we don't have perfect information, and so through this iterative process, hopefully by the end we uh, arrive at something. But Kim, your point is extremely well taken, and I'm learning. I, I I would love to spend a week or more. What you know, I've never seen how you work with students, and and I should right. probably also backfill for those that aren't um, familiar. Um, Kim, do you want to just uh, give us a quick little overview of what a typical day would look like for one of your students coming in? Um, and I think this is really helpful, particularly for those who may be interested in joining us, because this is a learner population that many of us have not worked with in the past, um, being adult learners yet working on subject matter um, that's uh, a, a adult basic education topics, which very much align with a K-12 type curriculum. But it's it's different given your context. So could you give us a little sense of that? Yeah, I guess I, I would need to start from the beginning. Our students come in and uh, we give them what is called a standardized test of adult basic education to find out mm -hmm. where their education level is specific to reading, writing, and math. Those are the three that we really get a good grasp of in that, in that um, test. From there, we have them, uh, you know, if their reading levels are low, they have to go on a pre-GED track, which we do not have very well planned out yet. Um, and we're learning that we need that more and more. Um, and then uh, for those that go into the GED track, we usually try and figure, we usually start with math. Sometimes it has to be very basic. So everybody does math for about half of a day. Um, in the day that, you know, in the time that they're with us. So they're there 9 to 11.30, and then they come back at 1, and they're there till 3.30. So we really don't have them for very long. Most of them just come one day a week. Some come two days a week. And um, so during that time, like I said, half the day is usually spent on math. Half the, um, the other time is spent on usually one other subject. So out of the four subjects that they're tested in, we usually try to get them to be able to take that first section because they only take one section at a time. So for example, if it's social studies, we try to get them to take that 
usually within the first two or three months, we try to get them up to speed on that. And then we just, um, you know, continue to work with them building those skills until um, finally they can take all four sections. So this year being new uh, to the new GED, we have um, only graduated four or five. I'm sorry, we just graduated our fifth. And um, that's in comparison to 18 last year. So it's much harder for them to uh, gain the skills in the short time that we have them. We do have two uh, women who are in our aftercare program, which after they complete their one-year life skills program with us um, living down in the mission building, they get a job and they move into aftercare housing and they can stay there for two years. So we do have two women who currently are working and in aftercare and still come up to do GED. So I think that's going to be something that we see more and more because this test is so much more difficult. I think it's going to take people a lot longer than the time that we have with them. Wow. And, and so from a design, instructional design perspective, Kim, you hit on so many things that are so important for us um, to think about. C clearly, we talked about the objectives, understanding what the test is uh, asking the students to do. And from what you're saying, the bar has been raised. Mm -hmm. And um, so getting our heads around that from a design perspective and just thinking again, hen, again ahead to page what we need to do with our jumpstart orientation, which the students will take two weeks and, and lay things out. I think that will be really important for us to continue to refine what these objectives are for the students. And then also, Kim, every time you tell the story of how your day works, I learn something new every time. So I think, and maybe the students could chime in. Um, Paige, you mentioned you have a, a special ed background, but that's different than what Kim's talking about. And so how how is it like for you as, um, as a, a designer to get your head around what Kim's job is and how we can support her with the instruction that we we prepare? Um, you know, I think one of the things that was helpful and um, hopefully will be going forward, you know, through the um, orientation was just that needs, you know, analysis that, you know, you guys did a really good job of kind of doing some of that um, you know, learner analysis and needs analysis for us. Um, I don't know, kind of like you were saying, um, Jen, you know, it would be so cool to go and kind of observe and, you know, see what they do in action. And I don't know if there's, you know, maybe we could find some videos or some things that help, you know, either individuals telling their story or something that would help us kind of wrap our minds around what the students are going through and, you know, how they're feeling as they're trying to learn all these things again, because a lot of them, you know, it's been a while since high school. Yeah. And you just triggered something else. And Kim, you could comment on this uh, possibly as well. We, we talked about having being the ability to repurpose K-12 open educational resources. Mm -hmm. And you said that's really a stumbling block for your learners because it comes across as condescending to have them read materials prepared for a, a sixth grader or whatever it might be. Yeah. But um, could you speak to that a little bit, Kim? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are tons of um, there are tons of resources out there, but but again, you know, dealing with things like combinations and permutations or probability, the examples are are so elementary um, that they really don't they're really not relevant for our learners. Um, pages module on responding to a writing prompt extremely specific what they are looking for with the writing prompts for the extended response that's in the language arts section as well as in the social studies section so they have to learn how to respond to that writing prompt very specific to the GED so everything all the resources that we found that are available um, don't do a really good job with that. E even some of the math stuff that we came across, um, you know, like Khan Academy, Khan Academy is wonderful, but for commutation, for combinations and permutations, we didn't find anything that was exactly like the materials that they were going to be tested on. So that's why with you all working on these very specific things that we're finding 
we that we can't get resources for or even with our current resources they just need more they need more time or they need more explanation and this is wonderful because i i don't need to go through this with tutors so that somebody is taking you know an hour or an hour and a half to ex explain combinations and permutations that's why this is so wonderful is because it's right there for them to go on to click on and to learn and then as they practice we can have those tutors working with them on the practice but for the teaching it's not this repetitive thing because they all come in with different skills they all come in with different you know, I, I had somebody today that tested. She has not been in school. Um, she dropped out at the beginning of seventh grade. Now she's testing pretty high and we're very hopeful, mm -hmm. but she's a 25-year-old um, woman who hasn't been in school since seventh grade. Mm -hmm. Wow. So wow. for us to put something, you know, that we're talking about, you know, butterflies and, you know, rainbows. Right in front of her is just it's not relevant to her world or even even the language that they're going to use in the test yeah and you know can this also raises a question or design concern actually that we talked about early on and we didn't haven't talked about yet is how we present our materials as i said we were using a powerpoint based for a lot of reasons we don't have money to do much more than that to begin with right but right. as, you're, as you're saying, a lot of folks haven't been in a formal education setting in a while and probably then haven't learned in an online learning environment. So yes. while you said Khan Academy is pretty cool and there's some resources like that, you mentioned early on to us that that's a concern of yours is how how far can we stretch the students in, in rolling out robust e-learning platform, for example, a learning management system, if they've never used that to use a discussion forum or you know, to, to post an assignment or something like that. Some of the, the technical aspects of the learning environment, they may not have experience with either. Correct. <laughs> they, uh, mo yeah, majority of them do not. Yeah, because that would be, you know, certainly as we're moving forward thinking, of, you know, a lot, a lot of the student designers it, uh, makes a lot of sense, are kind of frustrated at the with the platform that de we're developing with, but also we kind of have to think with what the students are going to be able to you know, to use on their end as well. Right, with their capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Sandy or anybody else, I, I can't, I'm having a hard time seeing who's logged on, and I apologize if there are more that I'm missing here. Um, but did anybody else have any other thoughts before we wind things up? Um, I just wanted everybody to kind of highlight what they thought was the most important design aspects and things that people should consider as they're potentially joining on with us in the in the spring and, and things that you wanted to highlight. Anything that we missed or you'd like to talk about? I was going to say, did I um, cover everything I should have, Shu? She's on Yeah, here. I think pretty much, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I really appreciate this learning experiences. Um, it just like you mentioned before, uh, we don't have enough time to actually uh, collect enough uh, feedback from everyone so we can actually uh, revise our final um, prototype. So um, maybe one suggestion is later um, for next cohort, if anyone, another group can continue to revise um, all those um, um, prototype that we design. So at least it, it can be more useful and can be better tailored to, to the groups. Oh, and Shu, I'm so sorry. You're hidden behind. It's on my interface. I am so sorry. I didn't see you sitting there. So it's okay. I apologize. <laughs> I moved around. I heard your voice and I moved the icon and then I saw you sitting there. I apologize. Um, yeah, that, you know what? Also, I really want to thank you in particular. Well, actually, all the students were great in their individual reflections, but um, we have um, the students periodically, I think we did six this semester, turn in individual design reflections. And just as you express now, um, you, all, you were always really good with um, suggestions of, for things for us to think about. And, um, and definitely, I know, Kim, that's something that was high on our mind. Looking at, for example, Unit 7, they had the World War II unit, which was awesome, but it was just too long for your needs. And so um, Unit 7, that was part of their task, was to chop that down into a more manageable one-hour chunk and then also look at ways that it could be aligned with, um, 
the social studies requirements on the GED. So um, your, your point is very well taken that these won't just kind of linger. Our goal really is very much to take what all the student designers have done and, um, and to refresh them as we, as we move forward. And Kim, did you have any thoughts on that as far as um, as we look to the future? I mean, we don't have to get real specific right now, but to, to that point, are there certain units that you have in mind that you're interested in us working on that come to the top of your head? For the next time? Yeah, either things you'd like us to consider revising that we've already started or um, totally new topics. Uh, well, you know, unit one is definitely something yeah. that needs to be done with the scientific method. Um, I, you know, I think I've gone through uh, all of the rest of them in a very preliminary, you know, preliminary overview. And Courtney still has to look at hers as well. I think that there are going to be some simple edits that we can make and be able to use them because they're pretty close to the mark, we feel. That's so. That's good. I think I think we're going to have to take just very little time um, to to work with them, and I think we'll be able to start implementing them uh, with our with our next set of students who start in two weeks. So uh, at, at least some of them we will be able to very quickly, great. which is great. And Sandy, any last thoughts? I have my muted. She might be muted. Well, thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Um, I think the last few slides here, um, I talked, we've kind of hit upon. I just wanted to mention as far as the call for volunteers, it is open through January 2nd. And um, if you hop over to designersforlearning.org, you'll see the link there. And um, Paige, I don't know if I've filled you in. Most recently, we do have 11 completed applications for your cohort. And so we hope to get more as we go on. And I mentioned to Kim before we started and turned on the recording that we may have to make a decision. I hate to turn folks away. So maybe I will have to um, raise my hand to help you guys facilitate um, some additional students. Because like I said, I hate turning um, some students away that want to help us volunteer. But that that that. We'll have to work worry about that in January, I guess, as we get closer. We'll get together, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And as I conclude every session, thank you again and again for everybody and to the students who joined us tonight and those that may join us in the future, and also to the faculty who um, to, who sponsor them. You are, really are our primary reference, the faculty that will um, give us insight on whether the students are ready to take on this uh, project, either as a course project or an internship. So anything else, parting words, Kim, before uh, we head out for the night? Just thank you, thank you, thank you. This is awesome stuff, and we, I super appreciate it, and so does Courtney, and our students will will be, uh, will be greatly benefit from all of this hard work. So the uh, 446 hours are very much appreciated. <laughs> Great, and, and your time as well. I, I really appreciate all the, the input and time you give us each, each um, semester, so thank you. Well, everybody have a great holiday, and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.